Happy Tuesday. Welcome to episode eight of Living Well. Um, today we have on two guests that I'm very excited to talk about. There's a lot going on in our world right now. And, um, and I feel like we need to talk about it. I feel like now is the time for us to use our voices for good and for educating each other on how we need to show up for other human beings on this planet. For our first guest, American country music singer and songwriter, he is signed to Broken Bow Records on the Stony Creek imprint, just like yours truly, for which his first two number ones include Best Shot and Make Me Want To. His current single with Noah Cyrus is called This Is Us. He is my friend and direct label mate. Please welcome Jimmy Allen. Uh, how are you? How's it going? My day's been all, all, all over the place, but it's been a good day. I can just imagine. I like your background there. Oh, thank you. Had to put the had to put the the Disney one on there for sure. Yeah, no kidding. I wanted to have you on the show as it was, and then with everything going on in the world right now, I was just like, "Do you feel comfortable coming on and just talking about it?" I look at the whole situation. Like when I first saw that video, man, I was like, "This dude, like." just murdered him on camera. I know. Like, I know plenty of police officers that I've talked to. Cousins are cops, some of my best friends are cops. Never in their life have they ever used that move. So the only thing my cousin's ever done is he, he put his knee on somebody's back one second while they handcuffed him, and then that was it. Then he got right up and put him in the car. Yep. Like, dude was like rearranging his knee and just kept putting, I was like, nobody's doing nothing and then those three other cops just sitting there i'm like come on man like yeah. um so i was mad i'm not gonna lie yeah but then i got sad because i pictured my son and what if that was my son or yeah. what if that was me you know like what do you do in that situation and then i'm sure who knows what george's thoughts were when he's sitting there like man these cops aren't helping me People are sitting here videotaping and not helping. I know. Me in that situation, I, I've I've seen it. I've seen it done. You know where a uh, family member of mine told me they saw something going down that shouldn't, and there was like thirty of them outside, and all thirty people approached the officer like, "Hey, you got to get off of." What that did was it created distraction. The officer stood up. He got in somebody else's face, but nobody else was down on the ground getting, you know, in the situation they shouldn't have been in, you know? And I, I'm sure people were nervous, didn't know what to do, just in shock. But eight and a half minutes, I was like, man. So I was like, I definitely got to say something, but I wanted to wait until all the different emotions kind of settled a little bit, you yeah. know? Um, because when I say something, I want people to feel the pain uh, but also, I want it to be used to kind of open people's eyes a little bit, you know? Um, yeah. Or tell people, not, it's it's naive for me to think that someone that's not black will see the world through a black person's eyes. It's impossible. You can't do that. So the best thing I can do is kind of word it to the point where hopefully they can see it. And then over time, start to open her eyes and slowly start to see, because you can't change a heart overnight, you know? And a lot of people that might've been raised thinking, putting black people in a, in a category with stereotypes and sometimes feeling they were above them, they have to unlearn everything they've been taught, mm -hmm. you know? They have to unlearn all the prejudices and then they have to, and that takes a while. And then, and the fact of why you're unlearning a lot of prejudices, it's kind of like, you're processing the fact that your family raised you wrong. You know, it's like, not only do I got some stuff I need to fix in my life, your family let you down. Yeah. You know, and that's a lot. It's a, a lot, lot for somebody to process. 
you know so yeah so that's that's kind of just my my thing and it's been cool to see you know like the protests and stuff and how during the civil rights act 99.9 percent were black today it might be 60 40 non-black right you know, and, it's, and it's great to see so there's been a change and they said the revolution wouldn't be televised and and it's not because for me the the, the revolution isn't protesting and stuff revolution is what takes place in your mind and your heart when things change absolutely you know and uh it, it's it's cool to see um you know hopefully we'll get you know we'll get justice and you know i've been telling my family and my friends you know black white or whatever i say if you want to see change you got to start locally um voting for a president doesn't really affect your daily life but your mayor uh a uh, governor, uh, state representative, all that stuff. Because if you have a mayor that's for equality of everyone, blacks, whites, Asian, gay, doesn't matter. If they see something go down in the police district with the police, oh, guess what? That chief's coming up out of there. <laughs> like, they have direct. So gotta, yeah. yeah. That's the direct, like, hey, gotta go. So, the cool thing is, we just gotta be a lot more active. And who we vote for and on the local level, not just nationally, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, my heart has just been feeling a lot. Um, I was at the protest on, on Saturday and um like you said, I just I, I think it's such a steep education curve that yeah. a lot of the world has right now. Mm -hmm. it's it's a lot to take in and it's it's a lot to realize um i want to ask you country music specifically because country music sometimes is criticized for its lack of diversity and mm -hmm. what is it like being a black man in a real white i mean it is a party over there i love it um in a real white man dominated format um I would say for me so far on the radio side and when it comes to my, my music supporters, it's been great. Um, yeah. Now, not our label, because our label is great. Mm -hmm. But there have been one or two people that work for different record labels that said some racist stuff, like to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I met one one person at a label and they told me, what? Well, I like you, Jimmy. You're you're cool for a black guy. Uh, a black guy. What, that, what does that mean? He said, "I'm just not sure how our country music fans would feel about you know your people, and you know there's not a lot of your people doing." I'm like, so I looked at him. I said some things I wouldn't repeat. Then I walked out. I was like, and that had that's happened more than once. And when people ask why aren't there more black people in country music, it's not because of radio. It's not because of fans. It's because the gatekeepers, the rec a lot of people at record labels aren't signing black artists. There's tons of black artists to sign. Like, for instance, my buddy Tony Jackson plays clubs year-round, makes a living doing it, mm -hmm. no record deal. And there's no way, because country music is still so dominant with, with country radio, there's no way to get an artist to country radio that's taken serious without a label and a radio team promoting it, you know? So, uh, yeah, it's, it, you know, it has its days where it's great because I stand out in the room, you know? <laughs> I'm not easily confused with people. I can make a record that sounds exactly like Thomas Beck or Florida, Florida Georgia Line. I could rip off their entire album song for song and people would still tell me each song sounds like Darius Rucker. Because <laughs> like, oh people, because most people see with their eyes, you know. Yeah, most I mean people. most most people hear with their eyes. That's what I meant to say. They hear with their eyes, you know. Right, right. So it has its ups and downs, man. But it, it, it's overall, I can say it's been great because I didn't have a fan base before country radio, and I joined the family, and I've had, you know, luckily I have two number ones now. Uh, you know, we're out oh. headlining and uh, to. And I have moments where I stand on stage some nights as a black guy. I'm playing 
to my own headlining sold out show of 3,500 people predominantly white. I'm like, wow, this world is not as racist as certain media outlets would like you to think, you know? And I that's mean, what I try to focus on. I hear you. I mean, I'm sorry on behalf of whoever that was um, who said that. It's just, it's so disheartening even in the past, you know, few days seeing artists post about things, not post about things. Um, mm -hmm. Rachel is this country music fan who posted about feeling the need to Google racism and oh. the town she was going to see a concert in. And wow. reading her post, it just left me speechless. Like I, I saw that. I didn't even know how to respond to it. Like, has that thought ever even crossed your mind? Oh yeah. Like there's been some towns, um, that I go to. So I, you know, I have my, I'm a, I'm a, I have my carry permit, concealed carry permit. <laughs> and there's some towns I've gone to where I've got my thing on my hip because I'm not sure, you know, but also I've learned it's, you, everybody's been in a situation where people tell you don't judge a book by its cover, but we've all done it. Um, I was at a show in Alabama. And three guys come up to me to meet and greet. Three white dudes, all three of them cowboy hats, big belt buckles, no women with them. And they're like serious face walking over like. And in my head, I'm like, okay, how's this going to go? But one dude says, dude, Jimmy Allen, we love you, man. Oh, we just want to have a guy's night and see your show. We didn't want to bring the women. I'm like. Whoa, whoa, this is not the response I was expecting to see what it showed you. You can't judge a book by its cover either way. Like, there's this one guy I played this show, and he's in the Mean Green Line since Outdoor Festival. And this dude got tattoos, long beard, a biker vest with a Confederate flag on the back. And he's in the Meet and Greet Line, and the whole time the Meet and Greet Line is standing like this. I was like, oh, man. How's this going to go? He comes over to me. Jimmy, man, I just want to tell you, me and my wife, we love your music. Yeah. And he starts naming songs from my album. It's like. Amazing. I was like, man. So I felt it. And, and, and I'm like, I look at it like this. As a fan, you know, you could go to concerts and not be sure what type of people are going to be in the audience. Mm -hmm. But as a Black performer, Somebody paying money to come see me, I doubt that they're racist. <laughs> you know, I'm like, even if you are racist, gotcha. You still paid your $30 to get in here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Gotcha. <laughs> you know? Gotcha. Uh, so, you know, it's, but I, I, I understand, you know, I've, I've heard other black fans say that. Like, I've had black fans come up to me at a concert, and in South Carolina, somebody said to me, this is a black girl, said, Jimmy, thank you for this. I said, what do you mean? She said, I've gone to so many concerts to where I'm the only black person in the crowd. And she said, tonight was special because I might have been the only black person in the crowd, but the person that everyone came to see looked like me. I was, ah, that's me. I never even thought about that before. Wow. And I was like, oh, man. But yeah, I, you know me. I choose to focus on the positive. And, yeah. You know, and Try to promote, try to stuff my face. No, try right. to promote love. Um, you know, I have my times where I, I am known to jab back and comment sometimes. Especially when there's a dumb response, like somebody, somebody says something just real dumb, just real, real dumb. Yeah, I just do something dumb back at them. Didn't curse. Didn't say nothing mean. Yeah. Just come on. I just made it known that they said something. Dumb. Like, mm -hmm. come, really? <laughs> right. But some, um, you know, it's uh, it's a lot of great people out there. A lot of people with open hearts. You're one of them. Open minded. Uh, that are willing to. Just understand, you know? And I tell people all the time, 
you can support Black Lives Matter and support police officers. Because the second we start saying that every cop is bad, we're putting ourselves in the same shoes that people say every black person is bad. We've become what we're going against. And, and that's the problem. Um, totally. Yeah, but, you know, I'm definitely thankful to be on the label that we are on. Uh, a little bit love black people. And white people, <laughs> everybody. He <laughs> loves everybody. <laughs> he does, that's, that's the the head of our record label, Jimmy and I, our label mates on the same label. And um, you know, Jimmy, I just appreciate you taking time to talk to us today and letting us know where you, where your heart sits, especially right now with all this going on. Um, he also has. His brand new single out with Noah Cyrus. It's called This Is Us. Oh, yeah. You should definitely check that Lizzie out. She has her new single out right now called <laughs> I Don't Love You. <laughs> Look at this label may love right now. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. Oh, yeah. But I, I love you so much, Jimmy. You're an incredible artist. You're an incredible father. Um, we've, we've played a lot of shows together, and I mm -hmm. cannot wait till we can grace the stage again hopefully when touring commences again but um i yes. really appreciate you for your time today thank you so much yeah I, we actually got a show june 19th june 19th seriously mm -hmm. it's a drive-in show and then okay. we just booked a regular concert july 2nd the other day no way because mm -hmm. my, my booking agent asked me say jimmy would you play concert i said yeah i'm on stage Whatever they do in the crowd is up to them. <laughs> well, I know. And we hope that, I guess, everybody stays safe. But true, if they choose to come yeah. to the show, then it's their choice. Yeah. And different states are different, too. You know, it depends on the state. Uh, because there's certain states that never had a stay home order. But right. I don't think North Dakota had one. I don't think uh, South Dakota had one. I don't think Arkansas had one. So it just depends on the place. And all I'm saying is I've been seeing these people out here doing all these protesting together uh, about the size of concerts. That's so true. Where am I? <laughs> That's true. My mind's like, we should, well, we should just start playing protests. Just bring our band and just set up at a protest and just play. Just send around a collection plate. You let me know where. I'll show up. <laughs> yeah, <I can laughs> show up and just sing. I love it. Well, I love you so much, and um, hopefully, I can see you in person soon. Oh yeah, I love you too, and 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 super. You know. It's great to see you doing what you're doing. You know, you're, like I told you before, you're open-minded, full of love, and the world needs that. And uh, we're thankful for you, and I love you. Love you, too. All right, guys, our second guest for this evening, frontline worker and currently residing in Calgary, Alberta, my hometown. From my group of friends, he's a doctor specializing in infectious disease, working on the front lines. We are so grateful towards him. Please welcome Kwaju. How are you doing? I'm so good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Sure. Uh, so my, my, my first name is Quad or Quadju. Um, and I'm a fourth year um, infectious disease fellow at the University of Calgary. And essentially what that means is that I finished med school and did three years of internal medicine. And now I'm doing subspecialty training uh, in infectious diseases here. For everybody watching, Quad is from Calgary, my hometown. And, um, you know, he's good friends with friends of my best friend and so quad I feel like you're you're partly my family <laughs> <laughs> so I know Canada is in a much better spot than a lot of other countries in the world right now with this pandemic um, obviously you know a lot of, of cities in the states have seen crazy numbers um, but Calgary is still a hot spot um, how have things changed in the hospital since all of this happened so, you know, I think that when we kind of realized how um, significant this was going to be and how much it was going to change people's lives, um, I think I really do have to commend policymakers as well as people uh, in the healthcare system, not just necessarily here in Calgary, but I think across the board in Canada, a lot of people made really difficult decisions and worked really hard to try to reduce the burden or reduce the impact that this would have. Um, and so Calgary specifically, I think, and Alberta specifically, actually, 
I think we at this point in time are in a fairly good position. The reason why I say that is that the numbers that we're seeing in Calgary, in Alberta, um, are essentially at this point today the lowest that they've ever been uh, since the uh, pandemic began. And I, I really do think that's a result of a collective effort, um, partly based on or due to people within the community that followed um, you know, the concerns or followed uh, physical distancing measures, as well as the healthcare system and public health really in the significant um, resources that they poured into things like contact tracing, um, into things like ensuring that our hospitals were safe, as well as ensuring that our hospitals were prepared to deal with, with the potential influx of individuals that might come in. Mm -hmm. And so right now we, we, we thankfully actually didn't see kind of the peak that was predicted to occur. Um, and I think that that's a really good thing. And I think that, you know, some people think maybe we went overboard, maybe we did too much, but at the same time, I kind of use the analogy of, you know, nobody has ever blamed a firefighter for using too much water and that it's better, better to be overprepared um, than, than to be underprepared. Absolutely. So have things, I mean, Calgary has entered phase one. Yeah. So uh, just last week, um, restaurants opened, hair, hair, hairdressers opened. I just got a new cut with masks. Oh, obviously. Great. <laughs> <You look> great. <laughs> But I looked like a grape before <laughs> with my hair. <laughs> I know. I was I was laughing at my dad and my brother because their hair is so long. And I mean, girls, you don't even realize. But be a change. So so I think that um, you know I think it had to happen eventually. I think that it's important, um, you know, not just for businesses, um, but also for people's mentality and mental health. I think it was important that that does happen. And I think it's important that it happens in a safe, uh, in a safe manner. Absolutely. Does it ever make you nervous as, you know, we're assimilating back to society? I mean, down in the States, obviously things have progressed into phase two and even further than that in, in some cities. Um, does it ever make you nervous that numbers might spike again? Do you think that as, as the phases progress and as things begin to open up, do you think we're going to see another spike or do you think we might see a spike in the fall again? Yeah, that's it's a tough question to answer. I, I think that it's definitely a possibility. Um, and the only reason I can't necessarily answer that for certain is because this, you know, it's, it's so new. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even though it's been happening since late 2019, it's still relatively new. And so it's difficult to predict how the virus is going to work, um, especially in the coming months, how um, people are going to react, um, especially now that things are a bit looser and, and things are reopening again. I think it's definitely a possibility that it might happen. And I do think that our, our, our province is preparing for that. Um, I think it's nice though right now to give a bit of a breath of relief in a way so that you know the people that have been working so hard behind the scenes can take a bit of time for themselves and 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 kind of recuperate yeah. and really it's hard it's hard to say uh, what's going to happen in the fall I think we, we have seen that with other viruses in the past there typically is um, a second or perhaps even a third wave but it's, it's, it's difficult to, to say that that's for sure going to happen in this instance. And so I think we just have to, again, prepare for the worst, use too much water and, and hope things uh, uh, work out well. And I mean, in terms of a vaccine, obviously I've been reading up and I know a lot of it is under question. How do you feel we're, we're doing in the process of development of a vaccine? Do you have a, a even feel of, of a timeline? Because I know you probably hear a lot more in your world than we do in ours. Yeah, so I think that's probably the biggest question that a lot of people have is, you know, I think most of us are under the assumption or the understanding that realistically to get back to quote unquote normal functioning world, if that's kind of the way we want to go back to, I yeah. suppose, um, 
that we, we will need a, vac a vaccine or an effective treatment. Um, in history or historically, really only a, a, the shortest time that we've ever made a vaccine was four years. Um, and so, you know, I think that we have to keep that in mind. That being said, obviously, we have better technology um, at this point in time. It's really a collective effort. It's not just one or two places that are working on this. It's a collective effort around the world uh, trying to develop vaccines. And I know that, um, for example, in the United Kingdom, they had started vaccine trials really as early as back in April. Um, and then just in Saskatchewan, there's, there's some trials of vaccines uh, as well. And so I think that with enough people working on it, there is definitely a possibility that we're going to see a vaccine production sooner rather than later. I think the timeline that we're looking at initially, you know, was quoted around 12 to 18 months before we would really see that. And I think that someone still holds true. Regardless of how quickly we develop things, I think there's still a process that, that we have to go through. You know, we have to make sure that it's safe. We have to make sure that's effective. Um, and then once that's all done, it's the, the, the creation of the vaccine or the, sorry, the mass production of the vaccine and then the distribution. And so I think we kind of have to keep that in mind that even if we do get a vaccine, um, how we're going to get it to people, everybody's really, really stepped up. Uh, to make sure that we're all doing this together and we're all um, in this together. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's really nice. It's actually really nice to see um, that, you know, when we're faced with, with adversity that we can all band together and, and really work, work hard to, to kind of produce an outcome that we're all happy with. As a black man living in Calgary, how do you feel about everything going on right now? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because I feel that because we're in Canada, um, because we're in Calgary, sometimes we feel as if we're uh, quote unquote protected mm -hmm. or it doesn't necessarily affect us. But I think we, we kind of have to keep in mind that it's, it's everywhere. I think it's not just one city, one country, one nation's problem. I think this is something that, that, um, is true of all places around the world. Totally. I think that's potentially more prevalent in other places than others, or it's just more visible. Um, but I don't think it's, you know, there's no borders necessarily to this. I think, I think everybody, um, or not everybody, but all kind of countries and all nations kind of experience um, it to some effect. It's, you know, I, I, have, um, I have a little brother uh, who uh, is in Houston and he's, oh my goodness, I forget how old he is, 16. Wow. Um, and then I have you know, four nephews um, who are in Phoenix. And it's, it, it kind of makes you stop and think. It kind of makes you ponder. Yeah. Because I, you know, I, I, I guess I worry for them. I kind of liken it to this idea that we, that, some of us have in the sense that, you know, if it doesn't affect me um, directly, yeah. then why should I care about it? Or um, then it has no impact on my life, so I, I don't need to do anything to change that. Um, but I think that's really the wrong perspective or the wrong idea to have in the world. Um, you know, you could, even, you could even think of it about how some people reacted to, to COVID, right? right. Um, people thought, you know, it's a something that really only harms or negatively affects the elderly. So if I'm a young 20 something year old person, do I really need to care about it? And do I need to try to, um, you know, flatten the curve and, and, and adhere to the physical distancing measures? I think it's, I think it's the same thing just because something doesn't directly affect you. doesn't mean that it's not a true problem. And I think that we, I think some people struggle, um, in dealing with that because sometimes admitting that there's a problem might mean admitting that you might be part of that problem. Um, and I think people are uncomfortable with that. I think, you know, I would be uncomfortable with that. And I, I am uncomfortable with that in certain instances where I know that there are certain things that I should or shouldn't do, but I don't, you know, admitting it means that, oh man, I should really, I really need to, to, to kind of stand up and face this. 
I completely agree. It's, it's such an uncomfortable thing to talk about and to say, and yet at the same time, I think it's our responsibility as humans on the, on this earth to say it because the only way that we're going to uh, address it and, and fix it and, and truly create change for like the next generation to be able to teach the next generation that, you know, we are human beings on this planet created as equal. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think that it, it, you know, instead of looking at it like this is a disruption to our lives, this is a um, you know group of individuals that um, are unnecessarily overreacting uh, to the current situation. I think we should really take the time to think about how can we change things, how can we improve things. People are not. I don't, I really don't believe that people are inherently bad. Um, I, I like to believe that a lot of people are just doing the best that they can with what they have. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, that doesn't necessarily mean that your best is always good enough. Sometimes it does take working on yourself. Sometimes it does take educating yourself. Sometimes it does take the, the willingness to be better, to, to change for the better, not just for yourself, but for humanity. Um, and, and so I think that we should really be approaching this as a time for us to all reflect and as a time for us to find something granular in, in the ways that we can kind of invoke change and provide change for everybody um, going forward. Because I, I think what worries me is that after all of this is done, um, do we just end up back where we were? Do we, do we not learn anything from this? Do we go back to what we were doing before and, and, you know, I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that there are enough people that are realizing and enough people that are fighting for this to, to know that we are going to make change and we are going to, to take another step forward. Um, but I think it's going to be painful. I don't, I don't think it's going to come easy and I don't think it's going to come for easy for anybody on, regardless of what side that you're on. I think it's going to be, a bit, a bit of a slugfest, um, not, not physically, hopefully, but, you know, no, but really that's, I, that was so beautifully said. I mean, that's how I think we, the only way to evoke change and to make it lasting change. And I agree with you that, you know, I hope that enough people are standing up and wanting to share their voice that this is going to make, you know, a, a huge step at the very least in the right direction. And, we will all see um, lasting change result from this. But Quad, I just appreciate you so much. I appreciate you wanting to come on the show today and share your voice. Thank you for being a frontline worker. Thank you for, for sharing your heart with us today. Um, and, and I cannot wait to see you in, in Calgary next time I'm there, even from a distance. Yeah, that's great. Can't wait, Edgar. Thanks, Quad. So now it's time, what the people have been waiting for, the Wellisms of the Week. The people love the Wellisms of the Week. Bank of America announced that it is committing $1 billion over the next four years in additional support to help local communities address economic and racial inequality, especially in the wake of the COVID-related economic downturn. The money will flow to economic programs involving jobs, training, small business support, and housing, but with a new added emphasis on financial commitment on health services and funding for communities of color. That's amazing, Bank of America. Yes. So, so cool, so, so cool. For our second Wellism of the week, 16-year-old Stefan Perez began marching into downtown Detroit with 15 people. More and more people joined him until he became the unwitting leader of a very large crowd. He made sure that all protesters would comply with the 8 p.m. curfew and ended up getting a call from Mayor Mike Dungan himself saying, son, I watched the video and I saw your leadership. I have tears in my eyes. You are everything that's special about the city of Detroit, we are going to fight this injustice because of people like you. That's incredible. <laughs> Stefan. Mayor Mike. So awesome. So, so awesome.
And for our third Wellism of the week, peaceful protests happened all over the country and are still happening. And a lot of them are creating a lot of joy, like this one. Well, you guys, um, this has been quite the week. It has been quite the week in terms of everything happening in our world. Um, and I feel like right now is, is the best time for us to educate ourselves on how we can learn to be a more fully accepting society. Um, I wrote an essay, which I feel I will post in full in the comments below, um, a little bit on just where I stand. And instead of a song um, this week, I thought I would read some of my essay to you. Um, you can read the full thing below in the comments, as well as I'm gonna be posting resources of where you can go to learn more, as well as donate if you feel um, like you, you have a few dollars to spare. But, um, but this is a little bit from my essay that I wrote about everything going on. It is easy to pretend to support something and then still not outwardly do anything about it. It is easy to think that we live in a world that has overcome racism and that we treat our brothers and sisters as equals, but sadly, that is not the case. It is hard for me to even imagine what it's like to be a victim of negative profiling by authorities due to the color of my skin. To the family of George Floyd, countless other families, and the black community as a whole, my heart breaks for you. It is completely unacceptable that as a society, we have let racism and discrimination continue to permeate our culture. It has plagued our world for far too long and the responsibility falls to each of us to bring that change about. We are not trying to start a fight, we are trying to end one. We will only accomplish this by coming together and demonstrating acts of love that reflect what's in our hearts. And we keep doing that until there is no us versus them, until it is all just us together. Let's use our voices to instill change in the spirit of one love. We are all created equal, every single one of us. Black Lives 